Hello, welcome. Uh, welcome to our uh, real world troubleshooting tips uh, for OpenStack operators. Um, my name is Anton Thacker. I work for uh, Walmart. And uh, we also have uh, two, uh, two of my coworkers here that will join us on stage. Jeremy McCrory, also at Walmart. And Scott Adkins from Walmart. Jimmy's actually uh, a core contributor to uh, uh, OpenStack Ansible. So we have a lot of, uh, hopefully, a lot of expertise on stage. So we're going to talk about um, some general uh, debugging uh, tips and tricks. Um, uh, we'll talk about uh, monitoring and logging, uh, how to gather VMs about uh, information about your VMs, um, troubleshooting DHCP specifically. Um, we'll talk about uh, how Cinder creates a volume. Um, we'll talk about if you don't have centralized logging, how can you look at your logs in some other ways? Uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, troubleshooting Keystone, and we'll have some, hopefully, some room for uh, uh, questions and answers. Um, but uh, this is this is a beginner talk. Um, it's uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna cover some specific things, but we also want you to think about uh, how we approach things. Um, uh, and there's there's different ways to troubleshoot problems, and so so we're, we're we'll show you some patterns hopefully um, on how to troubleshoot problems, and um, and you can apply those patterns to uh, not necessarily Cinder for example, but for uh, to other um, uh, projects and other problems uh, within uh, OpenStack. And uh, to kick us off, uh, we'll have uh, Jimmy. So really, the first thing with uh, any troubleshooting, you want to have more information about what happened, what went wrong. Um, OpenStack has a couple of really easy options for that, both with the CLI clients. Um, every client, like Nova, Neutron, Glance, Keystone, they each have a dash dash debug option that you can provide uh, when running any command. And what that'll do is give you kind of the, the actual curl API request that was made against the API endpoint, the JSON data that went to that request, and the JSON data coming back. Um, really useful for seeing what's actually happening, which API, especially when starting out and learning how OpenStack works and how the RESTful endpoints are hit, what they're doing. Um, and also, every service has a debug option in its config. Uh, the thing with that is some of the services, they'll be quiet 90% of the time. Then you turn on debug, it's a constant flood of information that's really overwhelming, but it has that one critical piece of information that really tells you what happened, what went wrong. Um, all right, so to kind of walk through this, uh, just an example of a Nova boot command. This is just extremely basic with the Nova CLI. Uh, with the debug option, this is just a portion of the information it gives you, but it's showing like uh, the endpoint, the example cur uh, curl command that was run, um, JSON data, like I mentioned, going back and forth to request the return code from that request, which in this case was 202 successful. Um, a really important thing here from this debug, though, is the request ID. So that's unique for every request you make against an API service. Um, and then we'll, we'll be following that through for all of Nova. Um, so following the boot on the controller side, this is the Nova API command, uh, Nova API services log. So that same request ID, you're seeing the same JSON data that the client was showing you was sent. Um, you're also seeing the request that Nova API made to Glance about the requested image for your VM, uh, and then some messaging between the Nova services. So especially starting out, I think really with troubleshooting, the most critical advice I could give you is learn how OpenStack works underneath, what services talk to which other services, and just kind of see where it's falling apart, if it is, and it, it happens. Um, Nova scheduler, so that's the next point where it's actually saying like, where should I put this VM? Uh, this is a really good example when, when there's default logging, just not debug. Um, it, this is basically quiet and constant, like there's never anything logged. When you turn on debugging, you can find out what filters were applied and why it decided to choose which hypervisor and which hypervisor it actually chose. And then on the Nova compute, the actual hypervisor side, um, it's the same original request ID, and then showing it successfully scheduled, it successfully created the VM. Um, so really kind of going through that flow, if you know how Nova works, each service to each other service, you can see like where the request failed, um, which service kind of conked out. Um, so logs are great. Uh, you're going to run into problems. That's probably the first place you want to look. 
but um, staying up the cloud for the first time, that's hard. It gets harder when you actually have people using it and relying on it. Uh, so they're going to, I mean, you have a full list of teams. This is just an example of everybody we pretty much have to answer to whenever something does happen. And um, you want to have those logs to point and say, like, here's what happened, explain why, help them remediate the issue. The important thing, though, is um, to try to avoid it in the future. So you want monitoring in place. Uh, you have an issue, put a monitor to catch that issue. And then, I mean, really the ultimate goal is to auto-remediate, self-heal. So you have an issue, have your monitor catch it, and then try, to, try its best to kind of resolve the issue at that point if you can. Um, another really important thing that you want to strive towards is to consolidate your logging. You don't want to be logging into every machine, every uh, OpenStack server, every hypervisor, anytime there's a problem to dig through the logs and see like, okay, which service failed? And uh, you know, it's, it's, it gets a mess, especially when you're growing at scale. Um, so con consolidate your logging, you know. Have them go to a centralized log server, go to an Elasticsearch. Um, there's just great benefits to that. You can see uh, somebody's gonna email you and say OpenStack is broken. And that's not helpful. So you want to say, like, OK, this range of time, what's going on? Which services are airing out? Where are my 500 errors from APIs? Um, and really dig into that. That's a good starting point. Um, Graphite, Kibana, great dashboards to kind of visualize, provide your customers with information so they're aware of it, too. Because just having an uh, open area where everyone has access to see what's going on within your cloud, it, it helps give you more time to actually fix the issue instead of answering like, yes, it's down, you know, here's why. You can actually solve it. They can see for themselves what went wrong. Um, and then here's just an example of one of our many dashboards. Um, not a lot happening here. There's a small blip where a hypervisor went offline. But we can say to our customers, like, you're on this hypervisor. It went offline during this period of time. That's why your VM was offline. Um, and Scott's going to talk a bit about more in depth about VMs. So taking a step back for a little bit, uh, some of the basic troubleshooting uh, often revo uh, revolves around VMs themselves. Um, user complains that they try to launch a, a VM and it didn't launch, it was aired out, or uh, they've got some kind of issue, maybe they lost their network on a VM and they need a little help troubleshooting it. So um, how do you tie uh, the information that they give you uh, to the controller, to the, the hypervisor, and, and understand basically the whole picture of it? Um, I would say to start way at the back, uh, understand how your hypervisors are named, uh, and the easy way to do that is with Nova Hypervisor List. Um, other commands take uh, hypervisors as uh, their inputs to limit the output that you get from the Nova command, otherwise you'll get too much information to wade through. Uh, and knowing whether your uh, hypervisor is named as a fully qualified domain name or a simple name uh, can make a difference. So you know, this is an example showing that all of our hypervisors here are fully qualified domains. Um, then you can uh, take a look at what VMs are running on a specific hypervisor. So in this particular case, we picked one hypervisor, the HVO2, and, and did a Nova list. Uh, because by default, Nova list only returns the list of uh, VMs for the tenant that you're currently running as. In this particular case, we're running as admin tenant. Uh, you need to specify the all tenants option in order to list all VMs across the board. So in this case, HVO2 um, VMs are uh, shown. We've got four of them, uh, one of them in an error state. Um, taking a closer look at the VM that aired out, uh, you can use Nova Show and you poke uh, the UUID of the VM and you get a whole bunch of information associated with it. Um, it might be a little difficult to see, but uh, uh, some of the information that you see here is the hypervisor that that VM is running on, uh, the instance uh, ID, uh, which is uh, what libvirt uses on the hypervisor side, IP address information, uh, you get the, the tenant ID, the user ID uh, of the person that actually did the launch. Uh, and then, of course, you can see here you get a, a rather large Python error. Uh, this particular error is a little nondescript. I think it says at the very bottom that uh, 
uh, an unexpected error occurred, which is really helpful. Um, sometimes you can take this information and maybe do a Python stack trace to kind of uh, digest what really happened. A lot of times the kind of errors that you would see here would be something like uh, quota exceeded on something, uh, maybe you ran out of uh, neutron ports uh, or there wasn't uh, enough security groups uh, or something like that and you would see that very clearly here and be able to take that immediately to back to the user without having to do any more troubleshooting. A little finicky. Um, you can also take a look at the output of the console for the uh, for that VM. So basically, as if uh, uh, you're watching the boot up cycle uh, when the VM was launching, um, you use the Nova console dash log and again specify the UUID of the VM. Uh, in this particular case, I just pulled out uh, some specific information out of the console, and uh, you can already see some useful information that can be used later for troubleshooting uh, that includes uh, IP address information, you can see the MAC address, uh, you can see if the VM has more than one interface showing for whatever reason, uh, and you even get a little, a little information about the SSH key that was used. Um, probably uh, the IP address and MAC address are probably the most useful pieces of this, this puzzle. Um, if you wanted to take a look at the firewall rules, it's kind of a lot of users refer to that uh, as firewall rules on a VM. Uh, security groups are the one part of it which uh, uh, is stored as part of the VM configuration. And then you've got the other side on the hypervisor that would be stored as IP table rules or uh, open vSwitch, OVS, OVS rules. Uh, if you want to take a look at what the rules are in, for a VM, uh, you can use Nova Show to kind of get the list of uh, what security groups are there. In this particular case, I chose a VM that shows two security groups, uh, a default and then another security group. And uh, I did also pull out the tenant ID because uh, uh, if anybody's ever done the next command, which is neutron security group show or, or, or done a, uh, a security group list, you'll see lots and lots and lots and lots of security groups and maybe most of those are default. And considering that every tenant has a default security group, you need a way to actually narrow that down. So the next command you see, uh, I actually take the tenant ID and use that as a way to limit my output, neutron security group list, dash dash tenant ID, and then uh, I'm grepping for the two security groups. And here I get only a single default as opposed to the hundreds of defaults. Uh, and the important pieces of data you get from this are the, um, the IDs of the security groups themselves. We can then take the security group ID and feed it into security group show, uh, which is another neutron option. And you can now see that this particular group has uh, two rules in it. And uh, I highlighted in red uh, the security group rule IDs. OpenStack's really big on IDs. You have to keep them uh, straight uh, because like in this particular case, you will see the word ID used multiple ways in different contexts and, and uh, you need to make sure that uh, you're, you're pulling the right ID. Taking a look at the other security group, um, this one has a lot more rules. I didn't highlight ID on this particular one. I'm not actually going to go through the exercise of showing what these rules are, but you can see um, that uh, port information is showing for these. Uh, port 8080, 8443, 8009, 22, so SSH is being opened. All of these are very clearly showing for this particular security group. Now. Taking a look at the hypervisor side, we want to connect up the dots. We were just looking at it from the controller side. On the hypervisor side, let's see if I can go backwards and come to it again. <laughs> well, if you are able to clearly read this slide, uh, this is a little PowerPoint glitch. Um, the, the way that uh, you take a look at VMs on that side, the easiest way is to look at the process list. You know, look at the KVM processes running on the hypervisor, uh, grep, uh, do a PSEF and grep for the uh, KEMU um, processes. And if you just examine a single process, which really would be nice to show, 
uh, in, what I highlighted in red is that the process line shows a number of details about the VM that you can readily see and immediately start to track other pieces of information from that. Uh, some of the information that you get uh, includes the UID of the VM for that particular process. Uh, you can see the port information, the port name, uh, and IP address of the console port. Uh, let's say for some reason the console, the VNC console is not working in Horizon. Um, you could SSH tunnel through and, and connect straight up to the, the port and take a look at the console visually if you wanted to do that. Um, other information includes uh, the actual physical directory uh, on the hypervisor that stores uh, the configuration for the VM, the disk images, and stuff like that. Also, uh, you can see the memory and CPUs allocated to the VM, all from the process line. If we go take a look at the physical directory on the hypervisor, you can see here that you get the console log. This is what the, um, what the Nova console log command actually dumps out. You see a couple disk images. Uh, the one that says disk is actually the root disk. The one that says disk.local is actually the ephemeral disk. And uh, lib, uh, the libvirt XML is the configuration of that VM which the KVM process is uh, built from. Um, another thing to keep in mind when you're doing troubleshooting is that the disks are not really full-fledged disk files. Uh, they're backing store uh, uh, disks that uh, map back to an RVD image um, that is downloaded by Glance. So if you know how VMs are launched, one of the par parts of the process is that uh, the VM is launched, it's pointed at an image. That image, once the hypervisor is chosen, uh, that image is looked at on the hypervisor. Uh, is, does the image exist already? Is it a CentOS image uh, on, on disk? If not, Glance will download it, and once it's downloaded, uh, then the VM, the KVM image is launched as a copy on write for that specific image, and then basically the, the disk and disk.local files that we saw on the previous slide are deltas of the images stored um, in the Glance cache. Um, the cache is basically varlib nova instances underscore base. And you can see here that there's a whole bunch of images already cached. Couldn't tell you what they are, <laughs> but uh, the ones that say ephemeral, uh, you can figure out that those are probably uh, 100 gig and uh, 17 gig, 20 gig, 45 gig uh, disk images. Um, if you wanted to actually track to uh, what um, which of the KVM processes are using which of these images. Uh, you can use FUser or LSOF. FUser I find to be a little bit uh, easier to use. And uh, if you know the process ID of the process that you are looking at, uh, you can um, basically uh, connect up the dots uh, as I show here as an example. Uh, and in this particular case, you can see which glance image is associated with the disk uh, file and which ephemeral disk image is associated with the disk.local file. Um, so coming back to the, the whole firewall rules concept of the VM, uh, how do you associate the IP table rules that are running on the hypervisor to the security group rules of the VM? Um, the easiest way that I find to do this is to look at that libver XML file and look at the tap interface that's there. Um, you just simply grep out the tap uh, uh, pattern from that file. In this particular case, we got a single tap device, and then you can uh, use IP tables and grep for that specific tap. And uh, you see here a number of chains that show up that's highlighted in yellow. Uh, there's actually two output chains and one input chain showing. But it's enough information to tell you the actual exact name of the chain, in which case then in the next example, you can do IP tables to dump out the entire uh, input and output chains, and that should map pretty uh, close to the security groups that you saw previously. Uh, looking at the top one, that's the, the input chain, you already can see port 8443, 8080, 8009, and port 22, which is exactly what we saw in the pr uh, previous examples. Uh, in both cases, input, output, uh, one of the other things that you'll see is a couple extra additional ports. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you'll see the DHCP uh, ports have automatically been added to this particular VM's IP table rules because, well, it's got to get DHCP. 
So kind of continuing on that note, um, I'm sure everyone's seen this at some point, you boot a VM, it's just not accessible. Um, and DHCP is to blame. Uh, the DHCP server is not behaving as you expected. So um, every um, VM interface is creating a port in neutron, when you're using neutron, it's creating a port in neutron. Um, and you can kind of look that up with the neutron port list command, just looking for the IP that the VM was assigned. Um, and then on your hypervisor, there's a few a basic TCP dump command can look when that VM is booting, see what's going on with the DHCP traffic. So that's port 67 and 68. And in this case, the VM's booting, it's seeing the request from the VM uh, to the server, like broadcasting to any DHCP servers, but there's no response. So obviously something's going on. And uh, let's see. So um, on your network nodes, there's a network namespace being created for every network uh, for the DHCP agents, and along with the routers, there's a few examples. So it, like each of those network namespaces correlate to a neutron network that you've created in your environment. So this first uh, highlight at the top, the net list, that matches up with this DHCP namespace. It's uh, named QDHCP dash, and then the same ID as your net, uh, neutron network. All right, so uh, you can also run commands within that namespace. So just IP netNS exec and your namespace and then whatever command. So here I'm just listing the interfaces with ifconfig and that's going back to loopback and the interface that correlates to the DHCP server. So again here, uh, it kind of cuts it off as, uh, I don't know, I've never liked why they did that, but maybe it's some kind of character limit. But it tells you NS, for namespace dash, and then kind of like the third of the ID for the neutron port. Um, so if you kind of if you do a neutron port list here again, you can find this. It'll tell you the IP. Uh, so ten six one twelve twelve one twelve twelve, and you do a neutron port show on that. It'll tell you it's DHCP um, because I'm in the namespace. Uh, so that's the interface within the namespace. So you can also do a TCP dump within that namespace against that interface. Uh, here, I booted the VM on the hypervisor. I'm checking on the neutron while I'm seeing those re, um, requests come through for DHCP. At the same time, I'm looking at the network node in that namespace on the, inter, on the DHCP server's interface, and no packets. So obviously, something's going on in the namespace. Um, and again, I can try to ping against the namespace. I can't ping the gateway. This is a provider network, so just a basic VLAN, I should be able to ping the gateway, and I can't. Um, there's a few things you can check, basic neutron things to look for. So make sure your agents are healthy. Make sure the DHCP agents are RSC hosting your network. Um, there's a few commands for that. I can never remember them, but um, if you do neutron help, it'll list it all out and just grep for DHCP. That'll tell you everything DHCP related. So you can list the network, on, the, on a specific um, DHCP agent, you can list a specific, say, give it a specific DHCP agent, say what networks are on this, and then if it's missing, just add it. Um, I think a common IT thing is to blame everything on the network. So sometimes it actually is the problem. Uh, I'm not a networking person by any means, but like a few basic commands, I know TCP dump, I know I have config and a few of the IP commands, and I can provide that to the networking team and say, you know, what's going on, here's some output, and they can actually make sense of it. So um, a few common problems, the, if you have a VLAN network for your VMs, um, the port's trunked, but it's not allowing that specific VM for your VMs, your uh, VLAN for that VMs, then, I mean, the network team needs to add that on the port switch. Um, and then another thing we've also seen before is uh, they're just allowing everything and it's just tons of noise on your network, tons of drop packets. Um, just kind of keep those pruned, it'll help you in the long run. Uh, so after the network team was given the information, you know, add the VLAN to the port and here are the same steps repeated and I can ping the gateway TCP dump is seeing the traffic coming in from the VM, the request, and also providing a response. And on the hypervisor side, 
uh, rebooted that VM, the request comes in, and I'm getting a response from the DHCP server. So to uh, stay, take a step back, um, just uh, so we kind of dug deep into the, some of the networking components, some some Nova uh, pieces. Um, so I wanted to take a step back and just to talk over how a, a center volume gets created, and just to kind of give you a picture of how complex uh, uh, pretty much everything in OpenStack is. Um, so uh, when you request a new volume from from Cinder, um, a request comes in through the REST API. It could be through the CLI uh, tools or through Horizon or some other uh, API uh, method. Um, so the Cinder-API uh, service receives your request. Um, it does uh, initial validation. Um, it obviously validates the, the Keystone token. Um, it'll validate your quotas. Um, so if you don't have enough uh, quota for the Cinder volume that you're uh, requesting, um, you'll, you'll get a, a four, 400 type error right away. Um, so every, if everything checks out, um, it actually will place uh, this uh, information into the queue and also into the database. So this is very, very high level. I'm, I'm skipping some things here just to kind of, just to uh, a 10,000 foot view of, 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 of how things work. Um, so, uh, so then Cinder uh, volume uh, picks up the request um, through the database, through the queue, um, and, um, and uh, actually forwards it to the Cinder scheduler. Cinder scheduler creates a list uh, based on the size, the type, availability zone, um, uh, any maybe like extra specs or anything else like that that you're requesting. Um, after that, the Cinder volume actually iterates through the list and uh, it goes and actually talks to the backend uh, drivers until uh, it's able to successfully um, create the volume. So the backend driver uh, actually does the uh, grunt work to create the resource. Um, uh, so if you're using uh, Ceph, um, it'll talk to Ceph. If you're using um, you know, any other uh, supported Cinder backend, um, it'll talk to that uh, particular backend and uh, create the storage resources. Um, after that, uh, Cinder volume gathers uh, uh, all the information about the volume. Um, so you'll have uh, all kinds of metadata that gets, uh, that gets gathered. Um, uh, probably the most important thing you need is uh, traditionally like a connection information. So if you're using something that's iSCSI based, you need to know um, how to connect to that volume. Um, it, it'll have information about your Ceph cluster uh, or any, any, uh, any other kind of uh, backend. Um, and then I think this is in, in the wrong order, but uh, the Cinder API at some point will respond back uh, to the client. Um, uh, so uh, uh, that, you know, the request was successful. So um, you can kind of see that there's uh, multiple uh, entities that kind of work together to create uh, this uh, request. And this is a very, very simple request. Um, if you're doing things like attaching a volume to a VM, you'll be dealing with uh, uh, Nova. Uh, if you're booting from volume, that gets a little bit more complicated. Um, so if any of these uh, things uh, break down, uh, you're going to have problems. For example, um, if your backend driver isn't set up properly, uh, your request will go through, um, and you'll get information about the volume, but uh, pretty quickly it'll error out. Um, and uh, you'll get a, a volume that's in an error state. Um, so let's see, let's take a look. Um, so this is really uh, kind of another way. So uh, like Jimmy was saying, uh, you should ideally have a centralized logging set up. But uh, what if uh, you go to your uh, uh, Elk stack, your Kibana console, and uh, you have all zeros, nothing is working, uh, and you've got to troubleshoot this. So uh, this is kind of an example of another way of dealing with this. Um, if you're troubleshooting Cinder, you're going to be dealing with uh, all of those services that I talked about. Um, and if some of them are running inside containers, um, uh, you got to connect to all those containers. And it's kind, of, it's kind of a pain to gather all the logs. So kind of a shortcut uh, until you fix your centralized logging uh, is you can use Ansible. And here I'm, I'm calling Ansible on the Cinder underscore all um, host list. Um, and I'm just doing a grep command for all of the Cinder logs, essentially. And kind of going back to what Jimmy was talking about earlier, uh, you do have a request ID, a unique request ID. And if you know that request ID uh, from, your, um, from, from your initial API request, uh, you can kind of follow through this. This is sorted in, um, in, uh, in like a, a time order. Uh, so you can see that the, um, the Cinder API receives uh, your request. Um, it sees that it's a a request to create a two gigabyte volume. It actually passes that to, um, uh, so actually the, the third, the, the last line that you see, that big blob, it's um, 
all kinds of information about the volume. Most of it is um, like default values. Uh, you can see things like the, the center volume type, um, the size, um, uh, who requested it, uh, the name of the volume, all kinds of stuff um, that's uh, associated with this request. Uh, this is the same request uh, you go through. Um, actually, so you, you can see right away uh, that the uh, Cinder API uh, returned a 200 error, uh, error code, um, which means it was a successful request. Um, and then you can kind of see uh, sort of in the middle of that, um, uh, right there, you can see there's an error saying that the uh, volume service is down, and then um, uh, below that, you actually see that the volume was created successfully. So if there's multiple uh, Cinder volume services, um, uh, and there's multiple ways for Cinder volume to create the volume, it'll, it'll keep trying until it succeeds. Um, so in this particular case, for some reason, I have a, uh, a Cinder volume that's down. Uh, I should probably go troubleshoot that, um, but we, we probably don't have time for that. Uh, anyway, at the end, um, uh, you have uh, uh, a message that says that uh, the the, uh, the volume was successfully created. Um, so this is uh, this was a grep command on that particular um, uh, request ID. Um, and if you if you don't, so obviously like there's there's going to be more uh, log entries in the individual service logs um, uh, for uh, for this request, and you can kind of uh, dig deeper into those um, as you're trying to troubleshoot some stack trace or something like that. Um, so hopefully you get some some information that's useful out of this. Um, uh, as an example, for um, if you're troubleshooting Ceph, uh, one of the very basic things um, is your uh, individual nodes need to be able to talk to the Ceph cluster. So Ceph is like a uh, client cluster model. So um, if you go into onto your node, uh, you should be able to run like a Ceph status command uh, to to be able to um, to get a status of the uh, of the Ceph cluster. If you don't get that using the the Cinder volume user. Uh, that probably means you don't have uh, proper authentication set up or something else is wrong. Maybe you don't have all the Ceph libraries installed and stuff like that. Um, so uh, another uh, kind of, uh, wanted to give an, a specific example um, uh, that we've seen, uh, that I've seen in, in production, uh, where if you have a misbehaving client that doesn't cache uh, uh, Keystone tokens, uh, and it's a, maybe a very, very busy application, it'll start hammering Keystone with uh, new token requests. And uh, you can you can get um, uh, so like a, um, a a symptom of that can be slow uh, slow response to new tokens or you you're actually your Keystone service is erroring out if it's completely uh, you know falling over under the load uh, you'll see a high load on the Keystone service uh, obviously you'll have a ton of stuff going into the uh, the token table in the Keystone database. Uh, so those are all kind of uh, symptoms of what's happening. Uh, you will be able to see a lot of requests in Keystone logs. Um, so if you are doing uh, um, uh, TLS offloading, if you have like an SSL, uh, you know, a load balancer in front of Keystone service, which you should, uh, you want to make sure that you have X forwarded for um, enabled so that that way you can look in the logs and see where the requests are coming from. Um, and uh, another cool cool thing you can do is you can do um, you can if you have uh, telemetry services enabled for your identity service, um, you can actually go into into the metrics uh, information and and find out who is actually uh, hammering uh, Keystone service. Um, uh, one uh, way to mitigate that is maybe uh, you can put a uh, a limit on how many requests can come in from a particular IP address on your on your load balancer. Um, uh, so here's an example of uh, specifically for Keystone. Um, so this is kind of a, this was, I think this was done, I guess like last year, maybe maybe a little bit longer. Uh, maybe, I think this was ratified initially like in 2013. Um, so cloud auditing data federation is a standard for all OpenStack uh, services to, uh, to, uh, to do auditing and logging. Um, so if you enable this uh, with Keystone and uh, those the above that, uh, this first box kind of shows you uh, some of the things that you need to enable in your Keystone configuration file. Um, this gives you tons and tons of information about, uh, in this case, in, about Keystone, but uh, you can also use this for other services, obviously. So um, here's an example, <coughs> excuse me, here's an example of um, the uh, uh, successful uh, Authenticate um, event. And uh, you can actually see uh, all kinds of information here. This is all one line in the log file, but uh, you can send this to uh, to your uh, telemetry services. Uh, hopefully, you have all that centralized and automated, and uh, everything is uh, 
uh, alerting uh, properly. Um, but this gives you a, a lot of information about the authentication request. Um, here's some more examples. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, uh, an example of a user uh, being created in Keystone. Um, this you can see like the, for example, the the outcome is successful. Um, you can see uh, the, the the tenant ID. Uh, you can see uh, hopefully who uh, tried to request this. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, another example of a role being created. Um, there's all kinds of um, uh, very useful information. Again, you can you can look at this manually in the logs, or you can um, uh, you know have it uh, properly federated into uh, uh, telemetry. Um, there's other ways to uh, consume these events as well. Uh, you can use uh, Solometer to kind of look at the, uh, the telemetry data that's available. Uh, I provided an example uh, here of looking at a particular Authenticate uh, event, and you can see all kinds of information associated with it. Um, there, you can also uh, consume the data uh, directly from the Rabbit uh, queue as well, uh, if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, an example usage of why you would want to do this, uh, uh, Anton covered one of them, like uh, you're, you're getting some kind of a, a token flood uh, issue going on, uh, misconfigured app, but you may also be trying to troubleshoot uh, user authentication uh, uh, errors. Is the user actually not typing their password right, uh, or, uh, or is it possibly somebody's trying to break into their account? Uh, if you are, uh, capturing these uh, uh, events, you can quickly determine uh, what's going on and, and troubleshoot it from there. Uh, some of the ones that we've looked at, authentication, success and failures, user create you know, updates and deletes, project create update and deletes. Uh, there's actually a wiki page that describes all the events, and it's not just Keystone related, but also Nova, Neutron. Uh, there's a huge list there uh, that you can take advantage of and leverage in your troubleshooting. Um, so well, anyway, that says uh, <laughs> questions. <laughs> we have time for just maybe a couple questions. If you could come up to the mics and ask there, that would be appreciated. And if, um, uh, if anybody else want to ask questions, we'll wait outside as well. Thanks.